Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we love you, we praise you, we honor you. We thank you for your presence in this house, and we just pray right now that you will anoint your word. Let it touch your people and encourage them today, in Jesus' name, amen. This is uh, one of those sermons that I have wrestled with for a number of weeks now. You'll see why in a moment. I want to be very, very cautious with what I say this morning. Very careful, very cautious. I spoke a few weeks ago on delusion and deception. And that that would be one of the marks of the end times. What you didn't know at that stage was that I was watching a certain thing on the television to see where things were headed, to know whether I should preach one step further than just generally preaching on deception, but to become a lot more specific. And today I want to come as close to being specific as I can without specifically naming names. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me unfold this and show you what I'm saying. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 8. First Corinthians 12, 8. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by that same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one and the same Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, and to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another one the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. For a moment, put yourself in the place of the Corinthians. You're living in a city in Greece that is laden with temples to various gods. And if you want good fortune for your planting, you go to one God. If you want love and affection, you go to another God and so on. Everything you wanted came from separate individual specialist type gods. And so Paul writes to these polytheists and said, Our one single God gives the gifts as he will. One God giving out these gifts. Let's do it again. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit to another faith by the same Spirit to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. You see what he's underlining here is it's not that we have to go to various gods in various places to receive these giftings they come from one and the same Spirit. And in verse 10 we have this to another, miraculous powers, and to another, prophecy, Pro prophecy, to another, distinguishing of spirits, and to another, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another, the interpretation of the tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same Spirit. He gives them just as He determines. Prophecy. 
prophecy. Prophecy is absolutely and definitely a New Testament gift. Now, not every church and not every denomination will allow it. Not every church and not every denomination will practice it. And some will actually try to redefine what prophecy is. I have heard some in the Baptist seminaries teaching that prophecy is in fact just preaching. I'm sorry, I, I don't buy that. It's an ecstatic speaking of one who is lifted up by the Spirit of God and begins to prophesy. Thus saith the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, we've just come from 1 Corinthians 13, by the way, if you're reading this in context, where it's been talking about love in the most excellent way. And in 1 Corinthians 14 now, verse 1, it says the way of love, follow the way of love, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. He's saying, listen, I, I would prefer that you all learn to prophesy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Remember, chapter 13, he said, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love. Here in chapter 14, he's saying, I would prefer that you prophesy. For anyone that speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. He's talking now about tongues. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his, in his spirit, or probably with his spirit, which, by the way, tells us it's clearly not a known language. It's a mystery, and it's an utterance between a man and his God. Verse 3. But anyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening and encouragement and comfort. King James, edification, exhortation, and comfort. Now when somebody stands up and says, Thus saith the Lord, number one, the Lord better have said it. Because what you are doing is standing up and saying, I am now speaking in the name of the Lord. I am his mouthpiece for this moment. Well, Old Testament prophecy was quite different than New Testament prophecy. The Old Testament prophets could call fire down out of heaven, quite literally. In fact, they could do many miraculous signs and wonders, including raising the dead. But New Testament prophecy is unto edification, exhortation, and comfort, edification, exhortation, comfort. Now, that's probably not the first thing that comes to mind when you start thinking about prophecy. Usually when we start thinking about prophecy, we think about the foretelling of the future. Somebody telling us what's coming next. And that's the fourth telling of the future. But biblical New Testament prophecy is unto edification, exhortation, and comfort. We'll talk more about that in just a couple of moments. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Somebody speaking in tongues draws attention to themselves. They edify themselves. But somebody that gets up and says, Thus saith the Lord, and brings a word that is comforting, exhorting, and edifying to the Lord and to the people. This one is building up the assembly. I would like each one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than the one that speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. Now, brothers, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will it be unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? 
even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds such as a flute or a harp. How will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? And he goes on and he continues with this line of thinking. What he's saying is, listen, when somebody says, thus saith the Lord, and they speak in the language of the general assembly, that assembly is meant to be blessed, encouraged, comforted. It is not telling of what's coming next. It is not a foretelling or forthtelling of the future. This began to multiply in the church. And as a matter of fact, more than just in the church, it, it began to affect even the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 19, you can take your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 19 and listen to Paul. Rather, listen to Luke as he writes the story of Paul. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. And there he found some disciples and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you received? And they said, no, we have, never, uh, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So this was not just a Jewish thing, this was a Gentile thing as well. Prophecy had begun to take root in the church. It was an ecstatic speaking under the unction and anointing of God. And it was comforting. It was exhorting. It was building people up and blessing people. It was allowing for the circumstances that were and lifting people so that they could find peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The NIV says strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. King James, edification, exhortation, and comfort. Well, twice in Matthew 24, Jesus warns us about something. He warns us about false prophets. People that are prophesying what God did not say. And as a matter of fact, he warns us about it coming twice in his future, which would be our future and possibly our present. Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew 24, and let me show you this. Matthew 24, verse 15. And here's what it says. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciple came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus said, watch out that no one deceives you. Number one. That's the first sign of the end of the age. Watch out that no one deceives you. There will be deception. But many will come into my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is, not, uh, the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are just the beginning of birth pangs. Then you'll be handed over and persecuted and put to death. And you'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many. 
Now I'm going to tell you, I believe that's what is happening now. We have nations fighting nations, kingdoms fighting kingdoms. We have people being put to death for the name of Jesus. And we have many false prophets who are deceiving many and shamefully of God's people. This will happen again halfway through the tribulation. You carry on here in Matthew 24 and you come down to verse 23. It said at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ or there he is, don't believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles. Now we're halfway through the tribulation by verse 24. So what we're seeing here is that there are false prophets going to appear now in this time and in the tribulation there will be more false prophets that will come up. Well, how do you know if a prophet is a false prophet? Now, this is going to blow you away. Hold on to your seats. They prophesy falsely. Go figure. What they say does not come to pass. And therefore, they're false. Now let me tell you how we handle this as people today. When somebody prophesies something and it doesn't happen, what, what do we do? Well, we, we absolutely want to let off the hook. We absolutely want to turn around and say, well, you know, maybe they were just having a bad day. Having a bad day when you're preaching is fine. Having a bad day when you're saying this is what God has said is simply not acceptable. Under the Old Testament law, and we are not under that law, but under that law, they would be put to death for getting it wrong. Today, what they need to do is repent. And you're saying, well, well what, what are you talking, what are you getting at here? Well. Let me be more specific. And first of all, let me be very clear. I am not making a political statement. Understand very clearly. But how many people did we see on Christian television telling us Donald Trump would win the election? Now, whether you love him or hate him, it doesn't matter. What matters to me is the number of people prophesying. Thus saith the Lord. One man got on the microphone and he said, Biden thinks he's won. Ha 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 And he carried this on. Another man got on the microphone and he said, he was talking to other people that were at a distance because of the COVID thing. And uh, he was saying, I am speaking to you from the future, and Donald Trump has won. So what do we do with that? Well, let me tell you what you do. A number of people will come along and say, well, he did win. Well, then why isn't he president? And some will say, well, uh, uh, you know, they just prophesied a win. No, no. Many of them prophesied that he would have a second term as president and that it would be consecutive this term and the next term in a row. They were very specific in their prophecies. So the next thing people do is they spiritualize it. Well, he may not have won in this world, but spiritually he's the president. We've got to stop playing with rubbish and stand back and look at a false prophecy and call it for what it is, wrong. So what should happen now? Well, those that prophesy thusly, if they have one ounce of character, should repent. 
publicly. As publicly as they made their proclamations, they should repent. It galls me to know that God's people are sending God's money off to these people who are no more prophets than the man in the moon. Take your Bibles, turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. It says, there were also false prophets among the people, just as there'll be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, denying even the sovereign Lord that bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Watch the next lines. Many will follow their shameful ways and bring the way of truth into disrepute. And their greed. These teachers exploit you with stories they've made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. He's talking here about false teachers and false prophets. And he's saying, listen, don't stand too close. Because when the lightning strikes, you don't want to be around that. Stand away, stand back, have nothing to do with them. Sadly, the more crazy you are, the more media attention you get. But I'll tell you now, God is not sleeping. He's watching. And he will deal with these individuals. In Numbers 23, Book of Numbers, chapter 23, verse 18, we have a prophet who was a prophet for hire. His name was Balaam. And Balaam would say this, Arise, Balaam. Numbers 23, verse 18. Arise, Balaam, and listen. Hear me, son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie. Or the son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I have received a command to bless. Be blessed. Uh, he blessed and I cannot change it. No misfortune is seen in Jacob and so on. God is not a man that he should lie. Now either God has lied to us about Donald Trump. Or those that claim they're prophesying in the name of Jesus are lying to us. Well, how does this happen? It happens when they get confused between their imaginations and the voice of God. You be very sure that if you are speaking in the name of God, it's God's word you're speaking. Dr. Hawking, Dr. David Hawking, a wonderful, wonderful, powerful man of God, has always said, and it, it stays with me, the only time I know I'm absolutely right is when I'm reading the scriptures. And it's the truth. That's why I include so much scripture when I speak. Because I can absolutely guarantee that is the mind and the word of God. Well, what do we do with prophecy? Well, the Bible says we're to test it. We're not to test God. We're not to try his patience, but we are to test prophecy. Let me show you this. Turn to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John 4, 1. And he says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus is not from God. 
So here is the first and most basic of the tests. The first thing is, does the so-called prophet believe that Jesus came in the flesh? And by the way, many liberal theologians do not. I didn't say all, I said many liberal theologians do not believe that there was a liberal Jesus. You would be very surprised to find out how many people that have international microphones do not believe that Jesus was literal, actual, and real. They see him as an allegoric figure. They spiritualize everything. Well, here's the second test. It's found in 1 Thessalonians 5.16. 1 Thessalonians 5.16. Be joyful always. Maybe I should just add into that, even in the snow. Be joyful always. Pray continuously. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything and hold to the good. In other words, don't shut down people who want to prophesy. And there are many churches that do. Frequently they do because they have such a large congregation that if they allowed people to prophesy, the service would never move on. They would never get beyond it. And so to maintain some decorum and some sense of order to the service, they shut down prophecy, and in many cases, they allow it in their Bible studies and prayer meetings. Well, we don't shut down prophecy in our services. Admittedly, it's considerably more difficult these days. But we don't shut it down. But then the Bible says, test it. Test it. Well, when somebody comes out and says this political figure is going to win or that political system is going to change or something dramatic is going to happen and it does not happen. Then we have to say this. Either God has become a liar or the person did not hear from God and they lied. Now my inclination is to say, God is still not a liar. And the people that claim to be mouthing his voice, they're the liars. Well, what do you do when, when this, this happens? Well, if, as I said, if they repent, we must forgive them. If they cover and carry on, turn them off. Stop listening. Use the gray matter God has given you. Move on to somebody that is telling the truth. In Isaiah chapter 44, it says this. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I the Lord uh, who has made all things. Who alone stretched out the heavens. Who spread the earth by myself. Who foils the signs of false prophets. And makes fools of diviners. Who overthrows the learning of the wise. And turns it into nonsense. Listen to what he said. I fool and foil these prophets. Who foils the signs of of false prophets who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers in other words those that are on point God brings it about God, those that are actually prophesying under the spirit of almighty God God will bring it about well how do we know I mean let's suppose somebody is prophesying but they're not actually prophesying uh, an event that's going to come up and, and so we still need to know if it's false prophecy or not. Well, I'll tell you what, God will never have a genuine prophet prophesy anything that is against what the scriptures already teaches. 
some of the best prophets I've ever heard and ever listened to will stand up and quote scripture. Thus saith the Lord, God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. And when you hear that, you know immediately this is the voice of God. They will never, ever, ever say, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt go and rob the 7-Eleven, and the Lord thy God shall be with thee, and grant thee favor. It will never happen. He will never ask somebody to prophesy something that is against what the Bible already teaches. And if you hear something that is off, you know right there and then, by testing that prophecy according to the scriptures that that is not the voice of God. Oh, really, why should we care? Somebody gets up and they spout off and they say something stupid. Why should we care? Well, first of all, because they're making a fool of you. They're making a fool of your faith. They think that you're so silly as to believe every word that comes out of their mouths. But really, the real reason we should care is they're making a fool of God. Whether you like it or not, Trump did not get in, Biden did get in. I was listening to this fellow online who has been prophesying that Trump would get in right up to inauguration day and two days after he comes back on with another prophecy and here's his prophecy God woke me up in the night and reminded me of Lazarus something is about to happen don't give up hope Trump is still going to win well he didn't win he absolutely didn't win. Now whether the election was stolen from him or not, if God couldn't foresee that and have a prophet prophesy just exactly that way, then I have a problem. Or better yet, God is a problem. I don't think God is in the tricking business. I think he puts the cookies on the bottom shelf. And I think we need to be very, very careful what we listen to at home, on television, in this pulpit and any other pulpit. Check it according to the scriptures. And if it doesn't line up, toss it out. Toss it out. In Jeremiah 14, verse 7, it says, Although our sins testify against us, O oh Lord, do something for the sake of your name. For our backsliding is great, and we have sinned against you. O oh, hope of Israel, its Savior in times of distress. Why are you like a stranger in the land, like a traveler who strays only at night or stays only at night? Why are you like a man taken by surprise, like a warrior powerless to save? You are among us, O oh Lord, and we bear your name. Do not forsake us. This is what the Lord says to his people. They, great, they greatly love to wander. They do not restrain their feet. So the Lord does not accept them. He will now remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. Then the Lord said to me, do not pray for their well-being of this people. Although they fast, I will not listen in, to, to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Instead, I will destroy them by the sword with a flaming, a flaming, pardon me, a famine and plague. But I said, ah, oh, sovereign Lord, the prophets keep telling them, you'll not see the sword or suffer famine. Indeed, I will give you lasting peace in this place. And the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them and they are prophesying to you false visions, 
divinations, idolatries, and delusions of their own minds. What's happening here? God said, I'm going to judge this people. I'm going to, really, I'm going to judge this particular people. This was a certain situation in Judah. And God said, I'm going to judge them. But their prophets came out and said, oh, don't worry. It's all good. God's not going to judge you. And though those that were praying here went back to the Lord, the Lord said, but I did not send them. What they're prophesying are lies and their delusions. Now we know there is a spirit of prophecy. It's the same spirit which inhabits all of us who are believers. We are a Pentecostal church and we believe in prophecy. But it is the one thing that we are told to test. Test. Don't just readily accept somebody that says, this is from the Lord. Test it. If it does not line up with scripture, toss it out. And if somebody prophesies wrongly and they have any ounce of character, they will apologize publicly if they have prophesied publicly. I have seen lives destroyed by wrong prophetic words. I have seen individuals' lives destroyed because somebody came to them and said, Thus saith the Lord, and they have given them bad advice. So you betcha, I'm careful. When somebody comes to me and says, Thus saith the Lord, my attitude is, Well, if that's you, Lord, thank you very much. Send a second and third per person with the same message. For out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, a matter is established. Lord, send me at least two others with the same message, and I will accept that this is genuinely from you. Otherwise, I'm tossing it out here and now. Remember, deception is the first sign of the end of days. And we are seeing it wholesale. It used to be that you just got it on TV. In fact, it used to be you just got it on radio. Then we jumped up to television. And now we have jumped on to the internet. And anybody and everybody could claim they have this gifting. Well, maybe they do, maybe they don't. But we, as believers, are responsible for our walk before God. We need to judge it. We need to test it. And be sure that what we are hearing is genuinely from God. I have a list of those that have prophesied falsely concerning Donald Trump. Now again, this is not a political statement. I don't care whether you like him or hate him. That's on you. What I care about is those that make public statements concerning his immediate re-election to presidency. And so now, here's what I'm doing. I am watching see how many of these people come forward now and say I was wrong I did not hear from God this was not the voice of God I repent and I'm sorry and when I hear that I will strike them off the list and say okay they had a bad day they spoke wrongly but God has forgiven them. I therefore have no right to hold it against them. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Thus by their fruit 
you will recognize them. Comes from Matthew chapter 7. Watch out for false prophets. Jesus said it over and over and over again. I want to be extremely clear as a Pentecostal church, we do not reject prophecy wholesale. But when somebody says, thus saith the Lord, it better beeth the Lord or you beeth in trouble. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious, precious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the joy of studying the word together. I lift up those who have prophesied falsely in your name. I pray for them. I pray, Father, that they will come forward and that they will just as publicly repent. They'll not try and find some way to squeeze out of it, but that they will repent for their behaviors. Because I know that not only would you forgive them, but the church will forgive them also. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.